Welcome to Access to Perspectives Conversations, the podcast for bridging academic landscapes. At Access to Perspectives, we provide novel insights into the communication and management of research. Our goal is to equip researchers around the world with the skills and enthusiasm they need to pursue a successful career. You will get insights around the topics of scholarly reading, writing and publishing, career development, project management and research integrity, all embedded into open science practices. Learn more about our work at accesstoperspectives.org. Welcome back to our show of Access to Perspectives Conversations. Today we are um, talking to Demita Snow. Warm welcome, Demita. It's great having you. Hello, thanks for inviting me. Good to be here. So, Demita Snow, to introduce you to our listeners, um, you're the Director of Accessibility and Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Strategy, Publication and Standards at the American Society of Civil Engineers, also known as ASCE. You were the founder and immediate past chair of the ASC Staff Diver um, Diversity and Inclusion, DNY Council, and also served as a co-chair for the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility Committee at the Society for Scholarly Publishing, SSP, where you now uh, serve as a board member. Okay. Um, you held leadership roles in the Community Engagement Committee and the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, and um, served as a judge for the Excel Awards for the Association Media and Publishing Network Associations Council. And finally, well, not lastly, <laughs> you also co-chaired the Publication Special Interest Group for the Council of Engineering and Scientific Society Executive executives sorry and you are the member you were a member of their annual meeting committee at the moment well these days you serve on the board of black associations executives and um was also former member of the research committee at the american american society of association and executives foundation that's a lot of the ui as in diversity equity and inclusion work you're doing how, if I may ask, how did your tra career trajectory um, bring you into the, all these esteemed positions? And what so, well, obviously it's important work to do. And what, what would interest me personally, and I'm sure many of our listeners as well, is how, how is that going? And well, we, we had a few conversations before um with um the sensitivity of the issues but also the opportunities that you have and serving in all these um capacities having so much influence in changing the paradigm and changing how things are being done in scholarship particularly in publishing and in the scholarly community but eventually also in society okay but to give you an easier start, so maybe if you could share with us some of your uh, milestones or stepping stones along your career trajectory, does that make sense? Sure. Uh, so what I'll say is I, um, as you mentioned, I work at the American Society of Civil Engineers. I was doing uh, DEI work, gosh, long before I started there. I was doing it in a volunteer capacity for several um, national organizations, such as the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, which is the NAACP. Um, they've been around since 1909 and other like-minded organizations. Um, I was fortunate in that I was able to, to bring that passion into the work that I do. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about my career trajectory, which is, you know, has morphed into so many different things. And I feel so fortunate to have been able to do a lot of the things that you've mentioned. Um, I actually began my career as a uh, graphic designer and uh, okay. <laughs> started at ASCE as a graphic designer. And um, I didn't know what scholarly publishing was. You know, I've been in the, the and that was over 20 years ago. And um, I was in a meeting um, and I'll talk about how the, the my DEIA work began at ASCE. And I was in a meeting um, we had a new executive director coming in, and he's actually our current exec uh, executive director, Tom Smith, and he talked about 
how important uh, diversity and inclusion was to the profession. And I, because of the work that I was doing outside of, you know, in my personal life, I was like, oh, wow, it's really important to him. Maybe we could do something here. And I, um, after that meeting, I contacted a group of folks within the organization and we became this little grassroots group and, and um, came up with a mission, vision, and some goals for such a group at the organization. And of course, they were based on the organization's core values. Um mm -hmm and presented that to the leadership team. And that was in, that was 10 years ago and we're still going strong. I don't chair it anymore. I chaired it for, for eight years and, and you know, that's long enough term and other folks mm -hmm. are doing great work with it, with the group. Um, but there were, you know, I, I will, I'll just say we were fortunate, you know, we had the, the, the supportive leadership from day one. And so, um, and, you know, I wish other organizations would have that as well. It, it makes a huge difference in how much you can get done and when you can get things done. Mm -hmm. um, that I was at that point, I was working in um, publishing technology, that area of publications, and I was still doing the council work. Then, then I had some opportunities to work for other to organizations such as SSP, AMMP, SES, um, and met really great people that were also doing this work, learned a lot from them. Um, I was one of the folks that at the beginning of the, the SSP DEIA committee, that is a huge committee, that is a forceful committee, that is a committee that is also still going strong since 2016. Um, you know, this type of work does not end. Mm -hmm. uh, there's always work to do. And there are a lot of great people out there doing work. Um, currently, as you mentioned, I'm the director of, uh, accessibility and DEI strategy for our publications and standards. And that position came into being, uh, from our managing director, Dana Compton. She mm -hmm. saw the need for such a position, uh, within our publications team, you know, our, our strategic plan, publication strategic plan, which is based of course on ASCE's overall strategy. Mm has a focus on uh, DEIA. We look at all of our processes and our policies through a, a DEIA lens. And, um, you know, that's a part of everyone's job within the publications team. Hmm. Uh, and since, uh, and so what I'll share, Wait. I can share a couple okay. of initiatives if you're interested or. Yeah, no, what just struck me, it's because you mentioned in a site, like as if it was normal, the DEI work is not only your responsibility, but the whole organization's responsibility. So it's cross-cutting and you just oversee things, right, for everyone. For our pubs team. Now, we do have a position at ASCE that is yeah. focused on diversifying the membership. ASCE has had that position, I think, for over 25 years. I don't know exactly how long, hmm. but it, it's been a long time. That's uh, my way ahead of many new. other publishers. Not most or all other. Well, hopefully they'll learn something from us. You know, we learn from others as well. You know, we partner with other organizations yeah. such as the the um, Royal, uh, Royal Society of Chemistry's Joint Commitment for Action on Inclusion and Diversity in Publishing. Mm -hmm. We also partner with the Coalition for Diversity and Inclusion in Scholarly Communications. And those are just a few um, mm -hmm. folks that I'll mention today. Yeah. Okay. So, because I don't, unfortunately, I don't think it's normal to have that topic cross cutting. I think it's it most often is a is something that individuals take on to, on themselves to yeah. advocate for within a company or within an institution, and then hopefully it gets institutionalized. But it's it's like so uplifting to hear that at ACE, it's just. In, like in the DNA of the of the of the publishing house. Absolutely, it is in our strategic plan, and um, it is ingrained in our work. Yes. So that's already a take home message that human rights and equity, the topics diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, like it's important to have a policy that it becomes normality and everybody can like can have it as a compass in a way agreed i i think that you know and that's part of the anti-racism framework 
you look at the policies and procedures that are in place, that's where you can make the most impactful change. Look at what you're doing as far as systems are. You know, system. look at your systems. Look at who you may be excluding in some policies. Mm. Look at how you're, uh, I'll say, uh, diversifying the profession, diversifying your editorial boards or, or staff. You know, look at where you're posting your job openings. Look at where... Uh, what your network looks like. Is your network diverse? You know, is it a homogenous network? Then mm -hmm. you need to expand it, right? So if you're going to, I'm using staff as an example, if you're going to increase your staff, if you need to hire two people, are you going to look at the same places you've always looked if you want to diversify your staff? Mm -hmm. You shouldn't. You should look at some new career boards um, mm -hmm. that specialize in diverse candidates. Um, you should look at maybe how you write your job descriptions. Do you really need a four-year degree to do A, B, or C? Mm -hmm. Pro probably not. Maybe you just need a certification or a high school degree will do. You know, a lot of times it's the response to some things that we do are, it's the way we've always done it. Mm -hmm. That No, that's, it doesn't, it doesn't help anybody. The way that mm -hmm. we've always done it, it has not proven to be the most effective way a lot of times. Mm -hmm. It's also disheartening now to see how even if it is a policy and actually in our constitution in germany that all people are equal by mm -hmm. law in this mm -hmm. country um where i'm sitting <laughs> um because now we but now we have a reference point taking to the streets like thousands and tens of thousands of people took to the streets and continue to do so um because we have uh far right-wing party in parliament again since mm -hmm. quite a while and they're gaining friction and it's really scary but now most people who normally would keep quiet have our constitution as a, as a reference point so it's easy to defend others who are migrants first second third generation so basically german mm -hmm. um, and even if they weren't our constitution said all people are equal And yet the country treats people differently, but that's unlawful, mm -hmm. even by politicians. So, okay, where am I going with this? Okay, like you said, I think there's never a status quo where you can lean back and take things for granted that are just and happily live after after, ever after. But we need reference point in order to 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 have it easier to do right and to provide an environment now to work in with mm -hmm. it for everyone to achieve our goals, whatever the mission sure. of the institution is. That's true. You know, the, a lot of organizations or people will say, oh, how do I, you know, how do I measure where I am? How do I, how can I tell if I'm making any kind of a change within the organization? And mm -hmm. my first answer is always assess where you are. You know, there mm -hmm. are maturity models out there. You can assess where you are determine where you like to be and measure that over time. Mm -hmm. So um, I will, I, I like to talk a little bit about the um, uh, Toolkits for Equity project from C4DISC. And I could share that within the anti-racism, there are three, I'll back up a little bit. There are three. The anti-racism toolkit for allies was the first one and that was in 2020. Anti-racism toolkit for organizations was 21. Uh, anti-racism toolkit for Black, Indigenous, and people of color is 22. Mm -hmm. So uh, there, those three or um, those three toolkits were created by the Coalition for Diversity and Inclusion of Scholarly Communication C4 DISC, which I talked about a moment ago. I will say that the anti-racism toolkit for organizations has maturity models. If you don't have a budget, there are a lot of free content in all three toolkits. But the uh, organization's toolkit is the largest and you could, and it's in chapters, it's in like a, five sections and each section has several chapters. So you can take out what you need. You know, there's a measure, measurements and measures. I can't remember the name of the, the exact name of the title, but um, use that as an assessment tool. Mm -hmm. um, find out, you know, always find out where you are. And mm. figure out where you want to be and get some tools to help you yeah. on that journey. I think it's great advice because usually people um, like request orientation, but then they end up 
comparing their own themselves or their own institution with another and that's never a fair comparison because and it could be yes you're right because every institution has their own legacy their own history their own scope their own culture culture <laughs> and there's just too many parameters so it's like university rankings you cannot compare one institution to another for any aspect also not for quality because you you can only so, if you okay. look at them as a place you'd like to be you know if as a place you'd like to be oh, yeah. like, oh, as a reference, reference point well. yeah well, yeah and i would love to but not generalize that. yeah no, no, because it could be um, disheartening for some folks and they're like, wow, we should be here, you know, and make them feel defeated before they even get to start the work. Mm. Um, and there are moments, I'll be honest and say, where you might feel a little defeated because things aren't moving as quickly as you want. I was talking to a colleague yesterday and about something and she was saying, well, it's just going so slowly. And I said, well, there is a thing called incremental progress. You know, you got to take the that 2% movement and go with it because it couldn't have moved at all. It could have stayed stable, you know, take the 2%, take the 6% and over time it may be 30%, but mm -hmm. you know, you have to start somewhere and um, it's easy to get defeated, but you have to, when you get in those moments where it's like, I, I just can't today, you know, I've had those days where it's like, I can't today. I just take a moment um, and take a deep breath, you know, you take mm -hmm. a breath. I will say, the I'll mention that for me, every day I have at least an hour that I put on my calendar as focus time mm -hmm. so that I can actually focus on what I'm, you know, the work and not be distracted by some other things that are going on and certainly not have someone schedule a meeting um, on a day that's fairly meeting heavy for me. So, yeah. and, and, and I will share with anyone, if you need time to step away, take a day off, hmm. take a break. I was reading somewhere that this one person took a day off every month just to oh. rejuvenate. Hmm. Um, and I'm like, oh, that's a great idea. I don't know if that's practical for everybody, but it, it worked for them. And it's like, I also tell that to early career researchers, PhD students, or anyone really wants to hear it, that it's part of the process. It's part of um, productivity to let things sit and evolve also in our brains, now in, in academia, we are all very brain heavy workers. And our brain is like a muscle and muscles, well, it's not a muscle physically, biologically, but it, it needs resting time in order to function well and also to process. You can't just feed it with information. It also needs to organize. And that's where we have our breaks and our off times and do other things like physical, activities or leisure activities meeting friends letting things sit and settle in our brains that's right. why we sleep also because of like sleep deprived people get sick not because of um exhaustion but well it's also exhausting but more because the brain has like a yeah short circuit kind of situation because it's just too much going on too much input so in that sense, but now with sensitive work, like you do, it's, and then like, like you say, like, it's, well, for you as a black professional it's always also personal because you live the experience and the effects that you're bouncing through your desk. And for that, to have recreational times, not only that, but also to find a distance for yourself between what's work what's personal and is this something that you can source from from your work to equip yourself to better uh i don't know to not let things get under your skin as much or i don't know if that's um i'm human some things do get under my skin yeah and, and it but it's best to and i i find it's best to address it you know, for example, if someone said something that kind of, you know, rubbed you the wrong way, you may speak with them. You might want to speak with them after you've calmed down a little bit. And um, what I've done is try to turn some of those moments into teachable moments and say, oh, you know, I heard you say so-and-so and I felt a certain kind of way about it and explain why 
um, I was offended or shocked by the comment, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. And then there are those other moments where it's like, you know what? I just can't today. I'm not doing, I'm not doing it. I'm not going to affect me. I'm not going to talk to this person. You mm -hmm. know, you know, we're all human and we have um, different ways of dealing with things, depending on the day, depending on the mood, depending on the hour. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's, I think it's, a, it's, it's relatable. It kind of work also for women, like, it's it's similar and yet different, obviously. But if you allow the comparison with the women rights movement, um, where we've come so far and yet there's so so many um, what's the word like disparity differences, um, and like to be in a be a woman in a leadership position and constantly being faced with misogyny or patriarchism, whatever. Um, I think it's, I don't know, maybe the, yeah, yeah, okay, I think I'm clearly overthinking this, but it's, it's, the important thing is to build routines of, to recreate ourselves, our minds, and to, to find safe spaces, and also a network of people, and a supportive network of people who think alike and act alike. Absolutely. Absolutely. There is a quote that I came across recently. Um, and I will look for it. Oh, it's anonymous. It was, I don't know who wrote it. And, and the quote was go where your energy is celebrated, reciprocated and appreciated. Oh, yeah. And I love that quote. And, um, and sometimes people need to do that. Step away and go mm -hmm. find that community um, I have that community. I'm fortunate in that way. I have it professionally. I have it personally. And I, you know, professionally, I have a community within the profession of folks that look like me. Mm. It's called the uh, Black Association Executives. Mm. And I'm actually on the board. And it is a um, group who's focused on um, creating a pipeline of association management professionals in the association field. Um, it is a feel that, um, a lot of people don't know is a career path, mm -hmm. uh, much like scholarly publishing people that look like me. Um, and so we want to, to open that up, reach out to folks and let them know, Hey, this could be a home for you. Mm. Yeah. To find role models and, uh, yeah, the community, a tribe of people who are ambitious and surely, and like obviously claim leadership roles in society even though there might not be as many role models just yet but then to become just that for others and on that path have each other's back as a people absolutely pupil. absolutely you know the support the mentorship reverse mm -hmm. mentorship because i'm a big proponent of reverse mentorship i think that a lot of times people think of mentorship as a one-way kind of street, you know, the, the person that's been in the profession a while mm -hmm. tells the, you know, early career professional how things are supposed to be. And I think a mm -hmm. lot of times those early career folks come in with some really good ideas, yeah. you know, we can all learn from each other. Right now, there are five generations of the U.S. workforce, mm -hmm. and um, there's a lot of information that could be shared amongst all five generations. And I think that we should value that. I don't yeah. know that everyone does. I know that some do, but it's a, it's it's amazing. I don't know the last time um, we've had so many generations in the U.S. workforce. The mm -hmm. other thing I wanted to mention too is that in the U.S., in about 15 years, our population is going to look like the world's population, which is majority black and brown. And we need to um, understand that. We need to, you know, the, the reason I do a lot of the work is to open up pathways, as I mentioned, for folks that look like me. And also, I'll be honest with you, I do it to honor the ones that came before me. Mm. Um, I have said to some colleagues when we were in the office, many of us are not anymore. You know, it's like because of the people that came before me, yeah. I can come in that front door. Um, I can sit in the same, say, on the same floor as you. Mm -hmm. I can, you know... I, 
have a, a similar position as you. And that wasn't always the case in the US. Mm. Um, still a lot of work to be done. This is not a perfect country. No country is perfect. But um, the folks that came before me had it much harder than I do. And I owe it to them um, mm. for the position I'm in. I owe it to them. I owe it to so many people. Um, I, you know, it, and yeah, many different people, many different people. So I, I have a similar feeling. Like when you say you owe it to them, is it is it a heavy burden on your shoulders, or can you see it as a as a self chosen responsibility you took on yourself? because you feel and know you can make a difference for even improving, to, to further improve what they've started or what no, they no, no. You know what I mean? Like, I do. I don't see it as a burden. I think it's something that I put on myself. I know that for the council, when I started the council, the DNI council at ASCE, I used to tell folks, you know, we started, we would have a few people show up and I'm like, look, if we, advance one person's mindset, we have done a great job because mm -hmm. that one person will go talk to five other people that mm -hmm. we will know nothing about. So don't think of, you know, think about it in that way. Yeah. You change one mind, you're changing others that you may not be aware of. One person tells one person, that person tells five people, you know, that kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't get discouraged so much as to, um, it saddens me sometimes when I see um, work happening and then I see, you know, revert back to the the the, the old way of doing things. It's mm. sad. Mm. Yeah. But then isn't it also that sometimes there's, it's like phys in physics, when you have an impulse for movement and motion, it takes a time before actual motion starts. So once the impulse is given, like a speech is being given, somebody hears something before they can act on it as a time passing without much visible change, but the change happens internally before it materializes. That's what I hope. <laughs> yeah, I, I I am not, I never, I would never say that I'm a patient person. I'm like the least patient person you can ever be. <laughs> but intellectually, I know, you know, that it takes time. Yeah. And that's why, you know, you reach out to other people. There are other people doing the work. And, you know, when you're on a committee, everyone takes on a task and everyone has the same end goal. So mm -hmm. you share the work um, so that it's not too heavy of a burden on one person. Yeah. Do you celebrate in the team or? By yourself with the family, do you celebrate achievements? I celebrate um, my work and my personal life are separate. I've always tried to keep those things separate as much as I can. Yeah. Um, with the council, we had a every year. It's a, a May May twenty first UN designated day, Cultural Diversity Day, uh, World Day for Cultural Diversity and Dialogue. That's always on May twenty first in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And the DNI Council in 2014 had our first diversity day, and it was around the 20. We always have something around the 21st if it falls on the weekend or something, um, in case it falls on a weekend. Mm -hmm. And so that's a celebratory event. We celebrate each other. We, when we were in person, we would have food events. People could bring in a food that represented them or their culture. That was, you know, whatever they wished. We had, um, decorating contest people could decorate their office to represent themselves and we had it was a contest so whomever did the best you know won prizes um it was food event you know food is always great to get people together uh we had puzzles uh one was around holidays of the world mm -hmm. uh, so those are some of the things that we were able to morph into the virtual space we would have people at home mm -hmm. you know in their kitchen creating a recipe um, and then they would share the recipe via email with the rest of the staff. Uh, mm -hmm. We'd have a speaker come in to talk about a particular DEIA related topic. Uh, you know, we could still do that in the virtual space. So those are some of the celebratory things we do. We have monthly events with the council. Um, personally, uh, 
there are some wins that I've had, you know, as far as people recognizing some of the work that I've done. Mm. And uh, I mentioned the anti-racism toolkit for organizations. That was a project that I co-led with um, Jocelyn Dawson from Penn Press. And we had over 60 volunteers. Though they, I mean, she and I did not know what we were taking on when we said we would do that. Oh, yeah, all these people. Well, Good luck. <laughs> it's, it's a lot to manage. And, you know, especially when you're doing this as a volunteer. But it worked out really well. Uh, they were a great group of folks. You know, we, we learned so much. We did so much. And it was a great project to work on. So I consider myself lucky to work on that. Mm -hmm. And when we ended it, we gave each other a, a pat on the back. We couldn't do it physically because we were all in different parts of the, the country and, and the world, actually. We had people from outside of the U.S. participate in that project. So, you know, you, you take those wins and you're like, okay, this is great. And you move on to something else. But I do want to mention that the toolkits for equity, those are all living documents. Mm -hmm. um, those are documents that we hope people take and use within their industry. It's not just for scholarly professionals. It, you can use it in other industries. You can alter the language as you see fit, but we don't want people to uh, take away from the, the message that we're trying to right. share um, in the document itself. Mm -hmm. Do not do not dilute the meaning that we're um, expressing. So, um, and all, all three, yeah, all three equity toolkits are that way, but I would say, read the one for allies that was written for white people. Mm -hmm. The uh, toolkit for BIPOC was written by BIPOC for BIPOC, but anyone can read it if they wish to. Um, we also got a design award for that one. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you know, we, we do like the wins. We do like the wins, yes. The toolkits are linked by the time you hear this, um, esteemed listeners, are linked in the show notes and uh, associated blog posts. So you have direct access and can make use of in your own um, facilities. Um, so because you mentioned allies, what there, some people may wonder what, and I wondered for some time, am I doing the right thing here with building Africa Archive the way I envision it? I work with Africans, Black Africans, obviously, most of the time um, throughout the day. Um, but then like, watching every step and every word I say and wherever I go. So I'm basically my own watchdog. <laughs> for better and worse. But for worse to the extent that my team I mean my team colleagues I said, oh Joe, relax. We got it's it's okay. We can like we're doing the good thing here. Because I was questioning every step of the game, which I think is, is important still because we're also changing paradigms as we doing the work but now and then i have a south african white colleague and friend who wrote an article about how to be a good ally what are your three uh suggestions or tips of what allies should or should not do even mm -hmm. if it's well meant because well meant as we know is hardly ever well done <laughs> so <laughs> Or what what are typical mistakes allies do? Like what I one thing I can think of to to overstep with the speaking on behalf. Um I think that's a really delicate line to transpass or not. So I'm basically really trying to avoid doing that. Um yeah. but yet it's important to step in and speak up where people of color shouldn't have to speak up because it's a no-go, but it's still happening. So, so I don't know. I would recommend um, two newsletters. I mentioned the Allies Toolkit already, but I'll recommend two newsletters that could be helpful. Um, one is called Better Allies. It's a weekly email newsletter. And there's another one called Anti-Racism Daily. Those I find to be super helpful for a lot of people, um, especially better allies. I A lot of the folks uh, within the publications team gets it every month. And what they'll do is like copy something and post it in the team's channel mm -hmm. to make sure that everyone sees it. Mm -hmm. And those are allies. They're bringing attention and, you know, and it's not me doing it. And I, the job should not be on the Black person to make, to, you know, to, to raise everyone's awareness. Everyone mm -hmm. should be doing it. Um, 
I also, and you mentioned, you know, some of the work that you're doing and you question yourself. I would also say that bring in people, you know, the person that you're talking about, ask them if this is okay to say, ask their permission. Yeah. Don't speak for them. Ask them what they think. Oh, yeah, Sometimes no, when you're advocating for someone, they may say, I really don't want you to talk about that. You know, mm -hmm. even though you may think this is a good thing, they may not want it addressed. Mm -hmm. And if that's how they feel, no matter how, you know, much you want to move forward, you have to respect that. Mm -hmm. Um I, um, I, you know, I mentioned mentorship, reverse mentorship. I think sponsorship is a great thing. I'm going to, you know, change the topic a little bit. Sponsorship, mm -hmm. you know, raise up people when they aren't in the room. You mm -hmm. know, if there's a project that's, let's say you have a project on A, B, or C. Yeah. And others may think, okay, these three people are great. They've always done it. And you may know someone, a person of color, and you're like, well, that's great. They could do this. They've always done this, but what about so and so? They have experience in A, B, and C and D. You know, you should talk to so and so and raise awareness that this person can do this project. You know, they may be that quiet person in the corner. That doesn't mean they can't do the work. It doesn't mean that they're not able to speak up. Yeah, I'm and a lot of people overlook them, and and it's not it's not right. It's not fair. Mm -hmm. But I definitely say sponsor folks. Um, to make sure that, you know, people know that they exist and, and you're raising them up and they don't even know about it. And you don't have to tell people that you, you know, are sponsoring them. You don't have to tell people that you mention their name to a particular individual. You're not doing it for yourself. You're doing it for them. Right. Exactly. Yeah, no, that's good advice. Um, cool. I think we have some takeaways for all the listeners to move on with. <laughs> Is there something else you want to... Oh, we have some questions we ask every guest on the podcast. So let's go there quickly. You okay. said that your favorite song is Purple Rain by Prince, a.k.a. The Symbol, who sadly passed. I think the same year my dad died. 2016. Oh, um, that year we lost David Bowie, Prince. Oh, yeah. Anna. Well, yeah, they... Prince is a, a, one of my favorites, but I'll tell you, I know you asked me what my current favorite is. I don't have a current favorite, but this Beyonce song, the country song, I cannot get it out of my brain. And I'm like, why? I don't even like country music. <laughs> but there's something it, about it a country it. song? Like Beyonce? It's, she has a country song. It's in the, yeah, it's like number one. And it's like, I don't know why I can't get that song out of my head. I am not a country music fan. Interesting. But just something about it. It's number one. So I guess a lot of people like it. Hmm. I didn't know, but maybe it's just in the States because it's his cultural legacy. So. Interesting. Okay. Um. Then the animals. You say you will only have dogs in the house. You love all well, of them. I, but then suddenly it appears you also have a dragon sitting there. I have a dragon. I have an aquarium <laughs> too. So yeah, I'm not a, a huge cat person. Um, when my sons were really, really young, we had two cats. They didn't, I, I don't like anything that can be at eye level with me. Oh. So cats made me nervous and, you know, the walking around behind you, I didn't know. <laughs> I I so it. we rehomed the cats, <laughs> but we always had dogs and, uh, we have a bearded dragon who is about 12 inches long. He's a big guy. Oh. They're easy pets. So I, you know, I could deal with that. That's an easy one. All right. Oh, Okay. Um, yeah, dogs and then favorite dish, Indian and Thai food. Oh, I can relate to that. Yeah, that's a hard choice. Um, that's a hard one to take. I'm a food, food addict. Like I can enjoy any food, mostly veggie or vegan because of the animal treatment, but I do actually eat meat also when it's, uh, organic, like happy. I, I say I'm a happy meat eater as in I meet. I eat meat that was happy as it was alive when it was alive uh -huh. still running. So okay. yeah, no factory meat for me. Thank you. Got it. Well, <laughs> but no, the bottom line is I I love eating. <laughs> You're a foodie. That's what we you, we would call you a foodie in the states. Oh, uh, like it's not funny. <laughs> um, yeah. Enjoy. That's that. That's a good thing. You enjoy. You know, enjoy those those moments. And if food is your thing, great. That's yeah, good. I had this uh, experience in Spain, Barcelona. Some people would argue, oh, it was Catalonia, not Spain. Um, 
and we were in a restaurant, a local restaurant. The place was empty when we entered, and 10 minutes later, it was packed with all locals. And they had tapas, homemade. Well, like, it was so, so the best food is the homemade simple stuff. It, like, it was nothing crazy, but it was so tasty. I had, like, explosions of happiness in my mouth. Like, seriously. That's great. <laughs> That is great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I also have been the scenery and everything, but yeah. Now, when in Africa, when I travel, I mostly enjoy not the fancy hotel food, but rather the local street food mm -hmm. or family food that people prepare. Mm -hmm. I'm in Germany, actually, like homemade, where my grandma used to prepare as a dish, just the simple stuff. The yeah. fuel was tasty. Ah, that was yeah. good. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Damita. It's a, it's always a pleasure to connect with you. And we will make sure that people make use of the toolkit. We will also incorporate it into our strategies. Um, well, all three of them and make them available in just a minute further. Thanks for all the work you're doing with the team. Thank you. It's Great fun. talking to you today. Thank you. And yeah, let's check in anytime soon. -ish. Absolutely. Absolutely. You take care. Okay. Thanks for joining us to listen to this episode. Do let us know what you think. You can email us or connect with us on our social media channels, which you can find on our website at accesstoperspectives.org. Email us at info at accesstoperspectives.org or book a call to explore how we can support you with your research planning, management and publishing. Welcome you again soon for our next episode. Until then, have a great time.